Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist evaluative UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My guest today is Janelle Estes. Janelle is the Chief Insights Officer at User Testing, the human insights platform that helps companies to see the world through their customers' eyes. At User Testing, Janelle plays a critical role. She is the voice of industry, and she has a significant influence on the product strategy, key customer relationships, and the definition and delivery of the business's services. Janelle is also the company's most visible authority on UX and CX, authoring white papers, articles, and speaking at industry conferences. She has also been known to give the odd podcast interview. Before joining user testing in 2014, Janelle was a senior user experience consultant at, perhaps, the world's most famous UX consulting company, Nielsen Norman Group. During her six and a half years at NNG, Janelle designed and ran hundreds of qualitative and quantitative studies using a variety of user research methods, including usability testing, eye tracking, field work, competitive testing, and longitudinal studies. Janelle is also the proud co-author of the book User Tested, which literally just came out a few weeks back. In User Tested, alongside her co-author, Andy McMillan, User Testing CEO, Janelle shares the stories of how the world's best companies are using human insight to create great experiences. There should be no surprises why I am looking forward to talking with Janelle on Brave UX today. Speaking of which, Janelle, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Brandon. I'm excited to be here. Well, like we were talking about before we hit record, you are, you're joining the ranks of some really well-known UX people, and I am so proud and pleased to have you on the show as well, Janelle, given your background and the role that you play at user testing. Now, I want to just wind the clock a little bit back further than your time at user testing, if I may, just to start, because I, I understand that you have a master's in human factors from Bentley. And I was curious because I couldn't really tell from my research and normally I'm able to get a real sense of the backstory behind people. But I was curious, what led you to study human factors at Bentley? You know, what was it that sparked your interest in human behavior? Yeah, it's a it's a good question and a, and a fun story. I didn't set out to do this. To, to have this career. I mean, I think it's very common in the UX space, maybe less so now because there are so many formal programs. But back in the day, uh, when I was going to college, I went to Bentley College at the time, it's now Bentley University, because I thought I wanted to major in accounting or finance because I thought that was where you can make the most <laughs> money. So right. I, yes, and they also gave me, they also gave me the most money in terms of a scholarship. And so you know, my dad is uh, has been in education his entire career and helped me navigate that whole whole scenario. And we landed on Bentley for 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 that exact reason. You know, they gave me a fair amount of money, and uh, and I felt I could get a good education, be close to home. Bentley's in the Boston area. I live in Maine. Lots of different reasons why. Anyway, I showed up there uh, the first year or two, I think I went from accounting to economics, to finance, to marketing, to I want to leave this university because I don't think there's anything <laughs> here for me. And I stumbled upon this little degree called information design and corporate communication. And, you know, it was really right up my alley. You had different focus areas uh, that you could, you know, work on within the degree itself. And Web design was one of them. And so that was the path I went on. The challenge was I graduated from Bentley College, Bentley University, with a basically a glorified liberal arts degree. And all these recruiters coming to campus, looking for accountants, looking for financial experts, and um, no one really looking for what I had, at least at Bentley. So I had a really hard time getting a job when I graduated from college, and I had a good friend of mine that worked at Forrester Research, and 
I got my foot in the door over there. And actually my first year in the corporate world or in the real world was answering the phone line for the customer service department and fielding calls from people, customers that couldn't figure out how to log onto the website. They couldn't find the article that they were looking for. You know, Forrester's not a cheap subscription. So there were sir, certainly some contentious conversations with people who were frustrated <laughs> with the experience. And it sort of piqued my interest because you know, a lot of the things that I was fielding were things that could be addressed more at scale through either the experience or or some other some other way of customer engagement. I recognized that while it was valuable, it wasn't something that I wanted to focus my entire career on and customer service, although I do believe that function is incredibly important for every organization. I ended up stumbling upon the customer experience research group at Forrester, which really kind of spoke to the degree I had and sort of the interest that I, um, that I really had around the customer experience. And I had a mentor and he actually ran the human factors and information design program at Bentley. His name is Bill Gribbins. He's an awesome person. Uh, and he talked to me about the, the master's program. And really it was really nice because I did four years within information design and corporate communication, and then I had to do two more years to get my master's. And I did that while I was working full time and, and, and sort of, you know, plugging away at that. But yeah, I mean, I don't know if it, it's kind of a roundabout way of landing in this place where ultimately it was like, you know, I'd go to these master's classes, you know, after working all day. I remember I had class from like five to 10 every Tuesday or something like that. And just the things we were exposed to, right? Like how the human mind processes information or how you make decisions, like all of that stuff is just like incredibly fascinating. And what I loved about it is that it wasn't just the theoretical sort of like science, if you will, behind how the mind works. It was this really fascinating intersection between that and how to design things to be easier for people to use, how to sort of like maximize people's cognitive abilities and minimize you know, the challenges that they might have in sort of interacting with an experience. And I just, it was so meaningful in a way where it felt like you could have such a massive impact on people's lives if you could, you know, use these superpowers to design experiences that, you know, most of the, the population could have access to. So it was certainly a roundabout way. I'm so glad I discovered it. You know, there's a million little accidents and coincidences that happen, you know, along life's path. And if you would have asked me at 10 years old what I would be doing, I probably wouldn't have said this. I definitely wouldn't have said this. Um, but I feel it's a very special place. Uh, and I'm, I'm fortunate to be part of the, the community. And you talked there about the struggle at university, and I'm putting words in your mouth here, so just step in and correct me if uh, if I'm misrepresenting this, but this challenge of when you're a younger person, actually figuring out what it is that you want to do, and you, you head into university often with these preconceptions about what that is, and clearly you, you've you walked a, a different path, and, and it's not uncommon to hear people who have entered the field of UX, they, they often come at it from a tangent. And that is somewhat changing these days with some of the programs that are now available. And it's more of a, I suppose it's more of a well-known and perhaps a more purposeful career path than it has been. But it certainly seems to me like you, you managed to discover UX and it's worked out fairly well for you. And now you can have influence at scale, clearly with the, what you're doing at user testing. But before we come to user testing, I was also curious to ask you about Nelson Norman Group. Now, clearly, it's a bit of an icon in, in the industry. It's very well known, mostly because of its founders. Yeah. They're very well respected figures in this industry. But I was, wanted to ask you if you could cast your mind back to that first day that you had at NNG and just what comes to mind for you? What do you remember? As you as you left Forrester and you were just starting this new journey at Nelson Norman Group, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I can tell you that I was so fortunate to have that opportunity, and my mindset going into it was to soak it all in, right? I mean, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It was incredible how it all sort of came to be, but I was one of four people hired of hundreds of applicants, and just felt like you know it's funny. It's probably imposter syndrome speaking, but uh, I know it is. 
But, uh, you know, I remember sending my resume over and I said, oh, I'm never going to hear from them. And you fast forward, right? And you're just, you're getting an offer and you're starting the job and you're talking to Jacob Nielsen and Don Norman, you're having dinner with them. You're doing research studies for all of these prestigious companies. You're doing your own independent research to inform papers and seminars. And it's like, you know, it, but I remember that, that moment of, I think before you start anything that's new, that's going to require you to stretch, you know, you sort of have to have that moment of self-reflection, a little bit of a pep talk. You can do this. Um, but yeah, the experience was incredible. Um, I learned so much. In what do you think they saw in you? You know, you mentioned that you were one of four out of hundreds of applicants yeah. and that little voice of doubt on your shoulder was sitting there <laughs> thinking that you're never going to hear back from them. What do you think they saw in you? Um, I think they saw in me somebody who was hungry and curious and eager, but someone who was willing to learn from the best in the industry. You know, it wasn't like I had 10 years of experience or 20 and had been doing things a certain way. You know, habits a hard thing to, to change, especially if you have particular, you know, viewpoints on how to do UX research, for example. And so, you know, I think it was a combination of being able to sort of mold and shape somebody into an expert um, and also the willingness of that I had to sort of take that opportunity. And thinking about that time, because you weren't there for an inconsequential amount, right? You were there for about six and a half years. What's the, the one thing that when you think about that time, that one lesson that served you really well in your career since? Yeah, it's a really good question. The one lesson I learned was that there's a right way to do UX research. Mm, and this sounds controversial. It, Please tell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily know if it's controversial. I just learned that there are certain principles that are so critical to conducting and gathering feedback that is, you know, has integrity, has rigor, and can be actionable. Um, you know, I think there's still, you know, I, I'm sure those listening in have seen, you know, poor approaches to this. And I'm not, I don't believe it will ever be perfect, but I do, you know, my big takeaway from that was that there's a right way to go about this. Um, and I learned from the best. Yeah, you sure did. You sure did. One, one of the pushbacks that researchers and designers get when it comes to research is the qualitative aspects of research. And often we're talking about research that's run not at scale. Yeah. And, and as you will know um, from what you do, that there is sometimes a bit of an eye roll when it comes to building empathy for users and the type of research that actually helps people to do that. You know, when that statistically significant challenge comes from the business to the research that the researchers are doing, which in this case, I'm framing it as qualitative and not statistically significant. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ways that you've found that are effective of taking that feedback on board from the business mm -hmm. and then reframing that and showing the business the value of what it is that you are trying to do as a researcher or as a research team and, and that work that you're setting out to do and improving empathy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think it's something that perhaps we've struggled with, or I know we've struggled with for a long time. I do see progression in the industry, though. I see more willingness and openness to do this, especially in the last few years with sort of, you know, everybody being disconnected. But to answer your question, I mean, the most important thing that I do when I'm, I'm doing this type of work or I'm working with customers is to make sure that whatever I've captured in terms of qualitative insight is actually just tied to something that the business cares about or can be tied to something that where you could make a decision to impact, again, something the business cares about. I think being researchers and myself included, you can get really curious about a lot of different things and your curiosity can kind of pull you in different places where you can sometimes go down into a rabbit hole and then all of a sudden, you know, you're standing there thinking, oh, shoot, what did what I just learned? How is this even actionable in any way, shape or form? And so constantly bringing it back to, you know, what the business cares about. I think that that is when you ask me about my my key takeaway or learning from Nielsen Norman Group, I shared that with you. My key takeaway and learning from user testing is is exactly that 
is that in order to be relevant, you have to show your impact. Otherwise, it's just another opinion. And this is a hugely important point. And I know that many people that are listening to the podcast will connect with it. But just so there's no doubt as to what things businesses generally mm -hmm. care about, what are those things? What are the things that are really important for designers and researchers to connect their work back to? Sure. Yeah. So it's, you know, key performance indicators like revenue, growth, profitability, reducing costs, uh, customer satisfaction, uh, and even things like innovation and time to market. There's so many ways that you can frame your work into something more meaningful. And I, I find that as UX folks, we have a language and that language often doesn't uh, translate to other functions of the business. And so, you know, being able to understand who your internal audience is and making sure that your work is tied to their sort of goals and the way they, they think about the world. It sounds super obvious, but I've, I've been, I've made the mistake several times and I, I see it a lot too. That all being said, you know, I, I have a, a fun story that kind of ties this all together. So AAA is one of our customers. So if you're not familiar with AAA, they're sort of like, you know, you call AAA when your car breaks down and they come tow it for you, or they'll come fix your flat tire, or how many times I've tried, called AAA because I locked my keys in the car, like, you know, and it's an older business. It's been around for, I think, over 100 years. And they have a digital presence, clearly, every business generally does. And they weren't seeing the conversions that they wanted to see on the uh, subscription page. So there was a page that had, you know, three different plans, and it was all led by price. It was sort of like, here's your middle tier, sort of anchoring, and then here's your lower package and your higher package. And the conversions weren't I mean, they were, people were converting, but they weren't meeting their goals or they weren't growing in the way they wanted to. And so the UX designer there, who's, you know, who I have a, you know, he's my colleague I, I chat with, he, you know, did some initial work qualitatively that showed um, people weren't really resonating with price. What they really wanted to know was, you know, can I trust you? Can I get value from you? Will you provide me safety? Those types of more emotional questions. And when he learned that, he proposed back to the business, you know, hey, I think we should lead with this potential way about it. So leading with the, the, the sort of things that really make people tick emotionally when they're making this decision. And they ran an A-B test because they didn't want to flip the switch completely because they're like, well, I'm not like, you know, it's just five people or eight people or however many he interviewed. We're not really sure. Um, and they ran an A-B test and this design that was focused more on the emotional like parts of making the decision outperformed the price led version. Like I, I forget exactly what it was, but it, it totally blew, By magnitude. blew it out of the water. Yeah. I think that's just a, a good example of the type of work. To me, that's like the ultimate value you can provide, right? Understanding your customer's on an emotional level, building empathy with them, and then suggesting designs and experiences that meet those needs, and then tying it to something the business cares about, which is converting people, uh, is it's our superpower. It is, and it's it's also something that we talk about a lot. And clearly, on a podcast like this, we we talk about it almost exclusively, which is this ability for user experience research and researchers to provide that lens of empathy to the business that enables them to make better commercial decisions. So this might seem as like a slightly strange question, maybe a bit um, out of the ordinary. But do organisations need? to do user research in order to treat their customers with empathy? You know, is it not enough for them as business people to just not act like sociopaths, not put things out into the world that are sociopathic and just to really consider what it, what it is that people need? Do they really need to be doing user research? Yeah, it's, it depends on how you define user research, right? And if I, I think about it as sort of this very defined approach to engaging with and empathizing with your customers. I mean, it's super valuable, but there are other ways that you can be building empathy with your customers if you're not, even if you're not doing formal user research, right? So I'm sure we've all heard examples of people who have, or companies that have call centers, right? And they send, you know, people from the product team 
or people from the marketing team to go sit with a call center rep for the day and listen to the the phone calls that they that 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 they field and the questions. It's a harrowing have. experience, right? It sure <laughs> Normally. is. It sure <laughs> yeah. is. Um, These brave people that man the phones. Exactly. There's also other, you know, other ways that you can build that empathy with customers that don't require you to do that formal kind of, you know, UX research approach. I'll give you another example. Um, I was visiting a major fast food company, global company, and I, um, this was, gosh, this was probably five or so years ago, really at sort of the height of social media, where every, you know, corporate or, or, or company had a presence. And, you know, social is still a very important part of many companies' strategy and approach, but this was like just the start of it, right? And so I remember walking by, there was this room and it was it was like a fishbowl, right? So it's like all glass all around it, you could see in. And there were a bunch of people sitting on bean bags and they had these... Um, monitors up on the, you know, kind of hanging down from the ceiling and they're tracking the Twitter feed and the Facebook feed and the sentiment analysis on top of it. And they're, you know, just like, yeah, I can almost say it totally yeah. into it. And I remember thinking, walking well, like, imagine if you just had like a feed also of real customers, just telling you about the last experience that they had with you <laughs> or what they love about you or what drives them crazy. Like that to me, is not really defined, sure, maybe you could define it as UX research, but really what it is, is like humanizing the customer. That's really what we're trying to do. And I think with all of the data that we have, whether it's social media, whether it's data analytics, whether it's, you know, the KPIs that I'm talking about, that like the business is tracking and living and dying in these dashboards, like where is the customer in this conversation? It's like we've over-indexed on all of these ways that we track. Um, and so... Do people have to do user research? No, not necessarily, but they should be pulling that customer in as, you know, and representing them as a human being wherever they can. Yeah, it's it's really removing an abstraction that we have placed between our organizations and the people that they seek to serve. Yes. And it's almost like we're uncomfortable, and I'm speaking generally yeah. here, clearly not everybody is, but it's almost like there's a discomfort with actually being faced with, the reality of a customer. And I do a lot of work with the financial sector and there are many bankers in particular, I'm thinking of a couple of bank, banks that I've been working with who have uh, worked for the bank for decades and have very rarely ever come across a com customer since they left that frontline mm -hmm. role. And you have to wonder what that means for the types of product and design and experience decisions that are being made. Yeah. But I also, I wanted to... Uh, sorry, you had, had something. I to... was just going to say I can relate to that. I was having a conversation with the head of um, e-commerce at a major retailer, and he had grown up with the company, right? So you know, had been there for twenty plus years when they were just storefront, and now are you know most of their sales are e-com. You know, he to your point used to interface with customers all the time in the store because he was running a store. He was a store manager, but then as he got promoted and moved into you know the sort of back office, if you will, of, of the company, back office probably isn't the right word. I think you, you know what I mean? He's, he's internal <laughs> I know to, you to yeah, yeah. you know, he's run, helping run the business. You know, he and his team don't have a practice of regularly engaging with customers. And so you can imagine his mental model of who the customer is, is very likely shaped by the interactions that he had in the store 20 years ago. Yeah, 100%. And, and that trickles through to the the small and the large decisions that are being exactly. made. I know you've just released a book mm -hmm. and I do want to come to the book, but I did just want to touch on this um, particular thing that I watched in your virtual book tour, which was yourself and Andy, who's the CEO of user testing. I mentioned, I think in your introduction, yeah. um, who comes from a product management background. Cause I feel like what we've just been talking about here is quite relevant to this. Mm -hmm. And he said, and I'm just going to quote him now in this video, mm -hmm. he said, Companies are realizing that users are so critically important. It's a challenge to say, how do you do that? How do you get folks into this process? One of the things that really struck me when I joined user testing was that there's this whole industry of people who have been focused on this. It was really illuminating to listen to folks like Janelle talk about how this could be done. Now, this really struck me because Prior to user testing, Andy was COO of products at Salesforce, and he was also a VP of product management at Oracle. Yeah. So these are quite large global mm -hmm. 
product-based businesses, right, that have customers all over the globe. But what does it say about user research and the, the sort of acceptance and state of it or the importance of putting the customer front and center if it's seen by executives who are, are as seasoned as Andy as still a bit of a novelty yeah. only as recently as 2018 when he joined U user testing? Yeah, it's I, I love this question. So it's so funny in this process of you know user testing, we just went public in, in, in November and you know, we're, we're out sort of, you know, talking about the business, sharing, you know, our value with potential investors and analysts and, you know, talking to just sort of like your average business person, like, you know, if you were to sort of like <laughs> average out the knowledge of like customer understanding across all roles, right. You're sort of in this place where like people think of customer research as focus groups or as, surveys or things like this. And so it's funny, it's like you, we would talk to them about what we did, or we'd show them a video clip of somebody reacting to a digital design. It's like, once they saw it, they were like, they couldn't unsee it. Right. And then, oh my gosh, I had no idea you could do this. And also we should be doing this on X, Y, and Z. And so like, it's broadly this really strange awareness problem that I see with especially people who are leading different kind of business units. And so, you know, Andy, for example, when he was at prior companies, he would do this type of work, but it would be the traditional way where you'd hire an agency and it would take eight weeks to get a 120 page report, which by the time you got it, you had already made the decisions that would have, that would have impacted anyway. And it costs lots of money. And so, you know, him as a former product manager or as just a product person, when he first kind of stumbled upon this idea of user testing. He always tells a story. It was just sort of like, holy crap, where was this when I was a product manager? But yeah, you're right. It's it's really fascinating to me that, you know, we've got this community of people that know this inside and out. I mean, they're literally, I would say that it is another language. It's so funny. Um, when I first joined user testing, they used to pull me onto calls with customers. And this was with a sales force that was fairly new and um, or, or account managers that were fairly new to the industry. And it's like, you know, I'd just go off and running with the customer. We'd talk about a million different things. And then I'd, you know, hang up and, I'd, you know, call, the person from user testing would call me and be like, what were you guys just talking about? Like, what was that? And so I think I do find it fascinating that there is this sort of like audience that knows this so deeply. And then so many people who just don't know that it exists. And that brings me to the book, mm -hmm. right? Because you've just written with Andy, the book user tested. And I couldn't help but wonder, is this part of your contribution in terms of raising awareness? And um, clearly it's aligned with the business, sure. right? So it serves more than one purpose, but is this part of your contribution to try and wait, raise awareness of this sort of magic that platforms like user mm -hmm. testing and the practices that people who use the platform do and learn and know so well? Is this part of your contribution to raising that awareness? Yeah, that's exactly it. And, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I've gone through a little bit of a, I've wrestled with this a, a bit, you know, in full transparency. I mean, ultimately the book is not written for UX people. It's, it, I mean, UX people will likely find it valuable in sort of different case studies and use cases and approaches that maybe I've learned in my career and can share back with them. But ultimately, the book is geared towards making this approachable and accessible to anybody who has a customer. I mean, the reality is like anybody who has a customer should be getting customer feedback in the way of face-to-face, human-to-human conversation. The challenge that I wrestled with while writing this and going through the process of publishing it is that it is not something that is new. It's actually a well-defined field that has existed for decades. I don't ever want people to think that I'm coming up with some new idea because it's not a new idea. What I am doing though, is trying to, uh, like to your point, raise the awareness, make it approachable, make it accessible and allow, you know, anyone who wants to connect with a customer, give them a guidebook for how to do it. Yeah. There's no point having a great idea if you don't tell someone else <laughs> about it. All that value right. is only worthwhile and only realized once it multiplies. Yeah. And I mean, this but is there, how there fields is a bit of... evolve too, right? Like there's bodies mm. of work that 
then new bodies of work build upon that, right? And it sort of like, it's just this process of raising that awareness. I was just thinking though, about the challenge that faces research in terms of the specialists that practice research, so the field of user research. Now, we're talking about making this more accessible. We've talked about ways of building empathy within organizations that might not be considered to be traditional user research. So just having those stories, you know, people sitting on, on calls, those sorts of things. But I also, I get the sense from researchers that sometimes they feel like this growth is a little out of control and that they're unsure whether or not the fidelity of the findings that's happening or the decisions that are being made off the back of research scaling valid and perhaps it undermines some of the rigor that they apply in their own practice. Now, I understand that you you used the analogy, I think your daughters at the time, this is going back a few years ago, were big Frozen fans. And there's this song called Let It Go, (laughs) right? So you must have watched one of my my talks. I have, I have. And my son loves the song as well. He's only three and a half. (laughs) But what is it? What is it that if the field is going to evolve? What is it that we need to let go of? Yeah, this is so it's funny when you asked me earlier on what was, you know, my key kind of learning from Nielsen Norman Group and my response was there's a way to do this. There's a rigor that's approach to this work. And when you compare that to the evolution of the field and the sort of premise of the book, as we just talked about, it's kind of not in line with what I said. I, I guess you could perceive <laughs> it to be that way. But the reality mm. is, I think. UX researchers, uh, UX user researchers need to start thinking about themselves as a catalyst for making more of this work happen. And when I see some of the best and brightest companies in the world that are delivering some of the most innovative solutions crack the code on this, like I am a true believer that there is a way, there's a, I call it the a method to the madness of empowering other people to connect to customers in a way that retains the integrity of the work and allows them to make sound decisions. Now, it's not easy. It's a journey. It's an evolution. It requires a ton of setup and support. But my feeling is that you have two options as a UX researcher. You can become an enabler, an empower, somebody who can help make more of this happen while you're still doing a lot of the work yourself. It's not like, you know, all the work goes off your plate. I haven't talked to a single UX researcher that's looking for things to do. But there's, you know, if you don't embrace that shift, the other the other the only other option is that people go rogue and they just do this stuff on their own. The proliferation of all of these technologies. I mean, the age of Zoom. Zoom alone could be considered <laughs> you know, a competitor of usability testing or user interviews, because you can literally just hop on a cust- on with a customer on a Zoom and ask them whatever you want. Um, so yeah. the reality is like this stuff is already happening. We need to sort of get on board and help activate different teams. Otherwise, they're just going to do it on their own. We're really not going to be happy with <laughs> the results of that. So what we're really talking about here, and if, if we sort of focus in on the role of the research leaders, who, whoever is in charge in organizations of research, what we're really talking about is scaling research, but doing it in a way that is valid still and in, in a way in which the researchers or the designers can be proud of the decisions that are being made off the back of that. Now, it's very easy for people, as you've just touched on there, to use a platform like Zoom um, or, or even user testing, for example, without the, the, the full knowledge of what it is that they need to put in place to ensure that the research is being run well. So what is it? What have you seen in, in your best clients, the ones that are really um, really making progress with this mm-hmm. at scale, this research at scale? What are they doing? What fundamentals are they putting in place? Yeah, um, so I've seen a lot of evolution and shift. Uh, and I think when this concept or approach was first being developed of empowering other people. It was a lot about control. It was a lot about turning everybody into a researcher. It was a lot about, you know, how do I make sure that, you know, everybody who's doing this has the depth of understanding and knowledge that I have or some level of that in order to 
for me to be able to trust them, right? And I think early on, this was when there wasn't a lot of tech involved in the process either. So sort of just letting people go off and meet with customers or do home visits or what have you. And I think as we have the proliferation of technology, as we have ways that we can start to capture learnings over time, it starts to become less about turning everybody into a researcher and more about giving everybody access to a customer perspective, either directly or indirectly, right? And so what I haven't seen successful is trying to turn anybody who you know wants to you know empathize with the customer into a researcher. What I have seen successful though is giving people opportunities to be exposed to customers at the right places in the right times. And so you know I think bes- aside from that, like that, that's generally been a shift that I've seen uh, in in sort of the industry. But aside from that, I mean the best programs that I've seen are the ones that pull the customer perspective into key processes. Like there are different parts of a workflow that a product team follows and a marketing team or a content creation team follows. And there are appropriate places where you want to pull in customer insight. Typically you see in the less mature organizations that they're focused more on empowering designers to test their prototypes, right? Which is a great use case. The more mature, successful ones I see pull that sort of feedback process and empower people like product managers or even designers to understand the problem space, right? Stay in that kind of squishy area to really understand, you know, who are our customers? What are their needs? What's the right problem for us to solve? And uh, getting teams to, to programmatically pull in feedback there. So I think, but that, but again, that's, that's an evolution. Usually you have to. Um, I was just reminded of this today when talking with a customer, you know, prioritize, right? Where do you, where do you think you're going to have the most impact and focus there? Pull in eager teams, people who are hungry for this, don't force it. And then once you have some key wins, start socializing that and bringing other people along because that's what gets people excited and wanting to engage with you and and the team. I think this is a a key insight of yours. And I've heard you talk about pulling insight into existing processes Mm -hmm. before. It's often not the the thing that people initially want to do. Generally, people in design are more excited by uh, the novelty of creating something new. But there's something really mature and sensible and smart and pragmatic about starting with an existing process rather than railing against it, you know, sort of working with the business to get those wins before you actually then go about making a more substantial change. In your experience, though, working with your clients, have you ever seen the opposite be more effective yeah. where there is a need, you know, there is a there is a pressing need or there is a a, a desire to make a massive shift from, from the get-go? Yeah, it's, yes, I have seen it. And it's funny, the point about workflows, I always think about, you know, if you think about even just the this notion of integrations within a product, right? You think of yourself as like, you know, integrate yourself into what's already happening because that's where you're going to be able to build the most momentum, showing up where people already are versus making them go somewhere else, right? To do something totally different outside of their workflow. That being said, yes, I have seen uh, companies uh, do this well. And it's really interesting because what it ends up being is less of a, here's an approach to do a usability test of a, of a prototype or usability or a concept test of four different ideas, or, you know, it's less about reacting to, you know, a stimuli, if you will, and more about just making a connection with a customer face-to-face and having a conversation with them. So um, global consumer goods company, they are, which like could really be anybody, right? But bear with me here. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I they gotcha. make things like toothbrushes and those mm-hmm. types of things, razors. And they had such a rigor around how they developed their product and went to market. And essentially what they tried to do and what they were successful in doing is coming up with a program called Customer Connect. And it required everybody to connect with one customer a month. And it was just sort of like, this was just something that didn't wasn't baked into what you were already doing. It was a new activity, but it exposed a huge number of people to customers who hadn't 
done that before. And it wasn't like they were doing anything actionable based on the conversation. It wasn't like, oh, I talked to a customer and they told us to move forward with this idea or concept. It was more like, you know, oh, I talked with a customer and like, I understood, you know, their needs. And while I was talking to them, they you know, the doorbell rang and a kid ran in and, you know, I got to know them on more of a human level. And there's something about that. People connect with that narrative um, and it's super powerful. And I like to think about that as building more of your customer intuition, right? And building, like if you did 12 customer connects a year, one a month, imagine the level of knowledge or empathy you would build with your customers versus, you know, just continuing doing what you're doing and not talking to customers. And this idea of, I'm, I'm not going to label it correctly here, but this contact time, you know, this notion of making it a, a repeated practice of spending time with customers to develop that empathy and get a better idea of what is going on for them. Ideally, so you can make decisions that are going to serve them better and therefore increase revenue or profitability or whatever it is that the business cares about. That seems to me that the programs that do that without necessarily a direct correlation back to a metric rely somewhat on executive belief. Yes. There has to be some, there has to be, well, this is my assumption, has to be some sponsor or someone that's willing to go out on a limb here and actually commit the resources, particularly on a global scale, to make something like that a reality. You know, what are the, I suppose the most, I'm going to use the word brave here, the most brave design or customer-led leaders doing that is enabling the rest of the executive to believe in that like is, is there how are they selling this basically is the question <laughs> i'm curious about like how do you get something like that across the line when there's no direct tie back to the right. bottom line i know I, and absolutely you're right in that many of these initiatives that are broader about building this you know connection with a customer are absolutely executive led um every single one that i've been engaged with to answer your question on some of the best business leaders, I'd say, uh, you know, Satya Nadella at uh, Microsoft. I mean, he's a huge believer in empathy, not only in his you know personal life, but also in building customer empathy as a business because it just helps you be more innovative and meet those unmet customer needs. And there's no way you can identify those if you're not getting exposed to customers and building that customer empathy. So I would say he's the current leader that I that I kind of look to uh, in his viewpoint of, of how he talks about this. And I mean, of course, there's been other leaders, Steve Jobs, Jeff Bezos, both of which aren't running those companies anymore, obviously. But, you know, they also had that very sort of customer obsessed approach, starting with the customer and working backwards or being customer obsessed. And, you know, it's interesting. It's funny when I was thinking about writing the book, I... I thought about having the title be beyond lip service because I think that many executives talk about the importance of customer centricity. And yes, we're investing in customer experience. It's a you know competitive battlefield and it's how we're going to differentiate ourselves. But when you go actually talk to teams and you ask them like, how customer centric are you? I mean, we, we know this because we survey people annually at user testing and just the disconnect between what executives are saying and what's actually happening is like staggering. And so, you know, when you ask me who, who are the best leaders that are doing this, you know, the, again, the one I know of is Satya and, you know, some of the others that did this well, but there are so many that are saying it, but not actually investing in it or doing anything about it or empowering people to do anything about it. Yeah. And I have, I've have heard you talk about this too. And it, it, it is true. I mean, it's, a, it's a reality that the, the teams on the ground are disconnected from what the executives are saying about how important customer experience mm -hmm. is. So if the people who hold the purse strings say it's important, but then the reality for the teams that are charged with delivering that experience aren't seeing that trickle down into investment in, in the area, how does that reality shift, if at all? Like, how, Is there any danger that empathy is going to become table stakes? Mm -hmm at the rate that things are going, you know, what, what is it that needs to, to shift or change in order to make that a more readily apparent reality for more design teams or more, more mm -hmm. research teams, more companies. Yeah, it's like that, that disconnect, right, between this is important versus the people who are sort of making the decisions and working on experiences every day. 
And I think mm. I've said this, and you may have heard this before, like no one is arguing about the importance of customer experience and listening to customers. What they're struggling with is how to actually do it, how to operationalize it, how to do that at scale. And I think to be fair, research ops and integrating into design processes and product processes is a very good step in the right direction. I mean, there are, you know, fabulous research ops leaders that are changing the culture of, of companies and product development. So, you know, I think it's that, I think it's those types of change agents operating in different pockets of the organization. But I mean, ultimately it's about holding everyone accountable. And I, you know, again, the, the best programs that I've seen where it's like, you know, Hey, this is important to us as a business. And we're going to ask you to do these things on a regular basis or make sure this feedback is integrated before you make decisions or go live. Like that ultimately, unfortunately is, you know, the, a lot of ways the motivation happens is holding people accountable. And ultimately they build that muscle and it becomes part of their behavior because they see the value and they can't imagine doing it differently or going back to the way they did it previously. But yeah, it's, um, I guess I don't have a silver bullet or answer for, for you on that. I think there's multiple tactics to use and think like, I don't think we've perfected it yet or, or really figured it out. Do you get the sense that there's an over-reliance on metrics like MPS yeah, and CSAT? Absolutely. But the challenge is, I mean, I, I think we could probably have a 90 minute discussion on, on NPS. <laughs> the challenge is it's such a widely accepted metric. And when you remove it, what do you have instead? Uh, NPS is absolutely not my favorite metric, but it is a way to elevate the conversation with executives. Uh, and so, you know, when you think about tying your own work to something the business cares about, there are so many companies that are looking and tracking their NPS and rewarding teams based on shifts, positive shifts in NPS. And so unfortunately, until we come up with something that's a little bit more, in my opinion, actionable and more of a leading indicator of the experience. There are some tactics that I've seen teams use, such as, you know, an experience score for the top key flows that you're, you know, looking at on a regular basis. There are different ways to do it, but, and I've seen them be effective, but I just haven't seen anything socialized at the leadership level that's more pervasive than NPS. Nothing quite speaks to the people with the money than, than the metric mm -hmm. NPS. Now let's let's come to your role because I understand that your role you're now a publicly listed company user testing and there aren't many chief insights officers out there not not least that I'm aware of you know what is it that you spend most of your time and energy doing Yeah so you're right if you look up I always joke it's a little self-deprecating humor if you look up chief insights officer on LinkedIn, there's like three people with my title. So yeah, it's very, very rare, but think of me. <laughs> it's a rare club. <laughs> and I need to think I need to connect with those other chief insights officers because um, it probably, the reality is it means different things to different people, depending on the, the company that you're in. But the long and short of it is that I consider my role to be the evangelist for our customers and in our industry. Uh, Externally for user testing, yes. I mean, there's the book, there's um, the podcast that we do, there's speaking and, and all of that. But I find the most value and the highest impact when I can turn those learnings back into the company, both you know at the executive and board levels, as well as within different planning and strategic you know initiatives that we have. So when we're thinking about you know what are we going to be in three to five years or how do we want to show up in the market? Uh, you know, being able to sh share my perspective in that way um, is where I find a ton of value. You know, if you think, so I joined user testing, gosh, it's almost been seven years and I was employee number 96, I think we're now, I think over 800. And so as the comp would, and it's actually not that 800 is not huge, right? It's, you know, it's, it's a decent sized company, but it's, it's not like we're operating at the scale of like a couple hundred thousand employees, but the reality- It's half the population of New Zealand. So it's, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's fairly up there. <laughs> it's 
the reality is that there are so many people that have been hired to run and scale the business. It's a SaaS company that, and there aren't as many people that truly understand the industry and our customers. And so it's a little bit of a, it's a little meta, to be honest with you, to be being, I, I say I have like the researcher's dream job, which is I get to research how other research teams are doing research and then pull that back into something meaningful for the company to, to help them better understand, to help them better empathize with who our customers are, to build that sort of narrative for them um, is where I find a ton of value. Well, let's talk about that because yeah. people will look at user testing from the outside and and they will recognize it as a, a leading platform in this space. People will have um, various views on it, I'm sure. Um, as all companies do with the products and services that they put out there. But what are you doing to help paint that picture of empathy for the people that are making decisions about the product day in, day out? Like what role do you play in helping them to really see what those experiences are like for their customers and their customers' customers? Sure. Yeah, so I think it was in 2020, we kicked off an initiative called, we call it UT at UT. So mm -hmm. what we do is we have found different areas of the company to sort of integrate human insight into different workflows and decision points. So uh, we started actually with the marketing team and the marketing team, you know, was able to look at their kind of content creation process, their campaign process and figure out like where are the places where we can get people to react to different campaigns or different positioning, or even, you know, we went through pricing changes and getting feedback around that. Um, so, so many different places to be, to be getting customer insight. And I can share with you, like, we haven't been in existence for very long. And, you know, we also have been maturing the way that we listen to our own customers over time, right? It's all part of the journey and evolution. And it is, you know, it's, as I mentioned before, it's a very meta experience. We moved into uh, the product team uh, with UT at UT. So they have a product development process they follow. And similar to the example that I shared with you, of, you know, what are the most successful companies doing? We've integrated ourselves into our own product process. Um, certainly things that could be improved or, or optimized, but it's part of the narrative now. People know that, oh, okay, if I'm in discovery or solutioning, here's a handful of ways that I could use our own product to get what I need. Uh, and, you know, we've moved into our people team too. So focused on the employee experience, the recruiting, interviewing experience. And, you know, there's, there's so many use cases. And so that's a big part of what I'm focused on is continually bringing that to the company. Now, beyond that, there are different tactics that we use at user testing that I kind of run with as well. So, you know, we start every company meeting with a video of a customer talking about a recent use case or win or success story. And then, you know, we have Slack channels set up that we, you know, are able to, if we gather interesting customer feedback, we're able to share that to build sort of like this shared understanding of who our customers are. Um, and so finding different ways, again, to show up where people already are, to expose them to customers if they're not directly interacting with them, you know, if they're not on the marketing team or the product team or, you know, an, another team that's using our product. There's almost like an implicit expectation of a company like user testing to be eating its own dog food. And you mentioned that this initiative- you... drinking our own champagne. Yes, that's a better, I like that one. That analogy is much, much better. I definitely <laughs> prefer champagne over dog food. But there is this sort of outside in, there's an expectation, or at least that I'm projecting and placing on user testing that it's going to be world-class in the way in which it builds customer empathy into its products and users' research <laughs> and its own tools to do that. But I was just curious, because you mentioned there that that really only kicked off in 2020. Now, I'm assuming there were things you're doing beforehand, but was there some sort of tension or realization in the business as it's been growing and mm. scaling, you know, from 96 up to 800 that, and this again is a totally loaded and not a research question, but was the business in danger of losing its way? And has there been a decision mm. made or some tension to overcome to really put this back at the heart of what the business does? 
Yeah, we when we think about our long-term vision for, for user testing, we think about being able to bring the human perspective, the customer perspective to any decision. And the reality was that we weren't banging on our product enough to uncover the pain points of average people who don't know UX research inside and out to use our product. And so there is, you know, you, you, you go into user testing and if you have sort of this idea of what you want to do and you know who your customers are, it's, I mean, it's not a hard to use product. It's like three screens, right? And then you launch your test and then you probably have some way that you look at the results. But if you're just somebody who's never done this before is wondering, you know, I don't know, think of a really broad business question, like, you know, what, what, uh, you know, we want to rebrand right? Which we did actually go through a rebrand. How do I gather human insight about rebranding? You log in and it's like, oh, geez, I don't know where to start. I don't know what questions to ask. I don't know who I should be asking these questions of. And so we were, what we were trying to do was break down that barrier of, you know, again, making this more accessible to really anybody who had a question that they wanted to answer. So there are different things that we've introduced to our product based on those learnings. So a big part of it are templates, and it sounds super straightforward, right? I mean, if you log into any SaaS product, whether it's Canva or Mural or, you know, you name it, there's usually a template gallery. And we didn't have that at user testing. And the way that we introduce that allows now anybody to kind of go in and say, oh, yeah, that's my question or that's resonating with me or, oh, wait, I didn't know you could do that. Like, I want to learn, you know, I want to, I want to do that with that template. And so, you know, to answer your question, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, I guess the, the impetus for doing it was more around how do we make our product easier for everyone to use and more approachable and accessible when you put it in the hands of, you know, a people team, an employee team, employee experience team, a marketing team, you, you quickly realize that things like, oh, the way that we train people who are new customers that come on board is so research centric right? It uses all that language that I was talking about. We're trying to turn people into researchers. We learned so much about our onboarding and training process. We were like, okay, if we're talking with this sort of team, like we can't talk to them that way. We have to speak to them in their language. It just sounds kind of funny to hear that us as a company is realizing that. But, you know, again, the reality is we're growing and scaling a company that and pulling in customer uh, feedback but as we grow and mature, pulling that in more programmatically is really what we're focused on. So when I think about the growth of the platform, and you've outlined a couple of uses there of the platform. So one in particular could be to test, you know, some brand concepts for a company that is looking mm -hmm. to rebrand. Now, I get the sense, given given the sort of pedigree of your user research training and experience at NNG and what you've done subsequently, that there is some tension here within the business as it grows to acquire different types of customers. You've spoken there about we can't talk to these people who want to do the rebrand in the same way that we talk to our specific user research teams that we had mm -hmm. initially started with. And I get that businesses need to grow and they need to evolve. What from your origin or your genesis though as a user research and insights platform based in really solid principles. Do you wrap around these templates and these experiences that marketers and other people that are coming to the platform to use it for other things? Uh, what are you doing to ensure that when they're collecting or harvesting opinions, for example, that they're actually then able to separate the signal from the noise and they're actually able to make sensible and sound decisions based on the information that they're capturing, particularly when it comes to opinion-based research, which can be a little fraught when it, when it comes to smaller samples and, and what people say versus what they actually end up doing. Yeah, absolutely. So when we are building templates for those types of use cases, or we consider them to be templates that might not be a UX research audience, or mm -hmm. perhaps one that we would like to you know, it have more people get exposure to. We typically start with what are what what are the outcomes? Like what what is the what's the question that you're ultimately trying to answer here? And then how do we build backwards from that? Um, so thinking about something like you know, we went through actually um we rebranded and I think of this little test we did of our old logo versus our new logo. 
And we had done some quant research on it, but we also wanted to get actual feedback and opinions. And so what we did was we used one of the templates and kind of worked backwards from there, right? We were looking at things like, you know, how appealing is it? How attractive? So things like, you know, more quantitative in nature, but with a qualitative sample size, if you follow me. But then there were other things that we asked people like use three words to describe the logo or how it makes you feel. or And so these were more qualitative in nature and subjective in nature. But when you looked at it, you could ultimately see all of those things were bubbled up to the top. And that was because you were focused on choosing the kind of question you ultimately wanted answered. And then we did all the work behind the scenes. Like the templates are actually built. Uh, I would say that there's probably maybe a couple hundred questions in the template bank. Like it's not that complex. There aren't that many ways to ask somebody <laughs> their opinion or feedback on something. And so these are sound research questions that we then have built this database where we can start pulling them into templates where they make sense, where the goal of that template or, or test is to answer a specific question or have a specific outcome. So that's really kind of how we approach the templates is focusing on the output first and putting less of the onus of the person who might not know UX research in and out on asking them to sort of craft the questions, right? All of that is sort of um, built, you know, it's sort of um, the templates are, are sort of built with those little building blocks. If that makes sense. So they have, they have guardrails in place to yes. sort of accelerate a this simpler way to put it yes <laughs> got it got it you know you know there, there's this perception out there that user testing and i'm talking about the approach not necessarily the platform here that it's slow and that it's expensive is it no <laughs> no i mean even before technology right slow and expensive i mean i remember sitting in a lab in bethesda maryland with a team of designers where I was running the UX research and we were doing rapid iterative testing where we would test a design with a couple of people and then we'd go away. And I mean, I'm probably really aging myself here, but we had like laminated prototypes that we then like scribbled over with markers. Like there wasn't even a, like a Figma or a, you know, an Envision or anything involved. I was very sort of paper based, but the idea was we were able to like kind of get through three iterations of a design within a day and ultimately move forward with something that we felt more confident with that was going to perform better. Now, I mean, you fast forward to now, and I mean, it doesn't matter if you use user testing or you set up four interviews through Zoom on, you know, Wednesday morning before your staff meeting, like you can do, you can gather that same level of insight. Now the challenge does become with analysis, right? I think that's the, the hardest part and arguably the most subjective part especially if your, your, your approach is the same for every interview or you have the same set of questions you want to ask people or the same set of tasks, you can't really screw that up. <laughs> if you do it sound and you, and you sort of have your, your method and your approach that's been tested and optimized, the challenge then becomes like, okay, this person said that, how am I supposed to interpret that? And I don't think we'll ever get to a place where that can be truly automated. I think we can get to a place where we can get to what people said faster and more efficiently. We can have meaningful conversations about it and we can align around it. But I don't see any place in the near future where it is something that, you know, a machine model can create for you. Mm. I, ha I have, this is something I have been thinking about. And very early on, I think it was episode three would have been late 2020, I interviewed Dr. David Travis, who's a UK-based user researcher. He wrote or co-wrote the book, Think Like a UX Researcher, and he's been in the mm. field for about 30 years. And I remember speaking to him about the, the rise, and it was accelerated by COVID, the rise of platforms like user testing that enable people to run research in an asynchronous fashion at scale globally and and also through unmoderated means, right? You can use an unmoderated method. And he, his perspective was that he felt that there was a risk that the pandemic and that platforms like this would become, would make us over-reliant on unmoderated research. Mm -hmm. And we would actually be at risk of 
losing that close connection that we have with our participants, with our customers by running research asynchronously. Mm -hmm. Is there any merit in, in that concern or have you observed through the way in which people have been using user testing that there has been a an alarming, and again, this is a loaded question, but has there been a <laughs> an alarming shift towards research that is asynchronous and unmoderated? And are we losing anything as a result of that? Hmm. I'm sure there's always a challenge with, with using technology to fuel things that were typically done by humans. You know, I think the reality is as long as you are actually watching the videos, <laughs> And hopefully, you know, seeing people's faces and seeing their emotions as they use an experience or comment or answer your question, you know, if you think about the sort of consumer economy that we live in right now, I mean, how many, it's probably a bad sort of comparison, but I mean, if you follow certain people that you're fans of on TikTok or Instagram and you're seeing videos of them all, it's sometimes you feel like you're part of their life, right? And so- how can we, like, I challenge that we could probably do the same for our own customers. Like, imagine, it sounds a little outlandish, but like, imagine if we had a TikTok feed for customer feedback. Sounds weird, but like, I, I have imagined that as like this idea of when we think about not turning everybody into a researcher, but also giving people direct exposure to customers, where is that middle point? And I think that we can learn a lot from the things around us that people are really kind of tuned into. But I mean, I understand the, the kind of concern. And I think if you're doing unmoderated and you're not watching the videos and you're just looking at metrics of a survey question, that's one thing. But if you're sitting there and you're, you know, consuming the videos or you're at least drilling into the parts that you believe are going to provide you with the most value, um, I don't see a huge risk of losing that connection. What work do teams need to be doing who have been working remotely and are running research through the platform? What do they need to be doing in terms of integrating their synthesis or their perspectives on the synthesis that they do? when they're watching or participating in this research? Yep. Uh, so I've seen some really amazing examples. You know, back in the day, if you think about when this used to happen in person and, you know, we'd all be sitting behind the, the you know, mirror watching a session happen and there'd be a bunch of people, the stakeholders behind the scenes with sticky notes and we're doing affinity diagramming in real time. And like that just, mm. as you know, doesn't exist Really. Like in Bethesda, right? When you were talking about that rapid testing you were doing, you know, yeah. I love rapid testing and I love doing it in the lab because it's, there's just something about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, it's funny, right? Like when you're, it, the, the ability to sort of tweak the design in real time is so valuable. Like how many, I don't know if you've had this experience too, but like, you're like, okay, we signed up for two days of testing and we have 12 people coming in to test the same prototype. By the time the 12th person comes through, you're like, I know what they're going to say. I know what they're going to get tripped up on. Everyone's asleep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've seen it before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, uh, that freedom to sort of adapt and adjust is amazing. But in the age of COVID or, you know, digital disintermediation between not just our customers, but us and the people that we work with. I've seen really uh, creative uses of whiteboards, digital whiteboards used to collaborate in real time and watch a video together. I've seen it synchronous and asynchronous. I'm a big fan of synchronous because that's where you can start to have some of those discussions, right? Because everybody's coming at this. And I think that that's why this is so hard to sort of Think of a world where you can automate this process of if you and I were to watch the same thing and maybe three other people, three listeners, and summarize what happened and why, we would all come at it with a little different perspective. And it's about talking through that perspective of where you align people in a team and then build this like urgency to do something about it or fix it or change it. It's really hard to replicate that when you're either doing it asynchronously or, you know, looking at results independently and not really talking through it. Yeah, I 100% agree. Is that whole ladder of inference comes into play here. And if you don't have the ability to synthesize what you're all taking in 
in the immediate, it becomes more difficult to achieve that than if you yeah. than if you're doing that asynchronously. Now, I'm just mindful of time and needing to bring the show down to a close. Now, Janelle, I have been listening to you talk clearly today, and I've also just been somewhat curious about the fact that it's not that long ago that you were listening to people complain about the website experience at Forrester. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now you're, you know, C- CIO, Chief Insights Officer of a listed UX company. And there's not many listed UX companies out there. And you present to executives, you present to boards. You're clearly someone who's very confident and competent in terms of your ability to communicate with clarity. What have been the practices or the 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 people maybe it's mentors or the or the personal learnings that have helped you go from that person that was you but you back then answering the phone to someone who's now confident enough to stand up in front of boards of multinational companies and give them some insight into this space of ours wow i hadn't even actually thought about my <laughs> my career evolution in that way so thank you for for putting it in that perspective i mean there's been so many learnings along the way and so many sponsors and mentors that I've had to help me get to a place. I also feel like I've had the right opportunities. There's, you know, going back to sort of this idea of being in the right place at the right time and being somebody who is open to having the opportunity to try something new and take risks. You know, there's there's so many things that, that go into it, but I would say in terms of my most effective sort of communication styles of how I you know, even talk to my peers at user testing, or I talk to other folks who, you know, are within our customers who are trying to sort of understand, you know, what value could user testing or this idea of talking to our customers provide to our business. It's all about storytelling and the narrative. Uh, It's about owning the conversation, obviously welcoming engagement and collaboration, but coming in with a strong perspective and the ability to tell stories, to give examples, to show people, real real customers as human beings, to sort of help people come along with the story. And I think, you know, we always talk about in the field, you know, what is the, the statistic? Like people remember stories like 5x more than they remember numbers or data. Or try, I exa- forget exactly what the statistic is. I think we need to lean into that and we have perfect opportunity to do it because we are talking with customers and building these narratives every day. And so bringing those to life, whether it's through synthesis across many of them, whether it's just highlighting a single experience and talking about why that matters. But I would say that that's been one of the the main things that I've leaned on in terms of, of success. I also think of other big part of it is just asking for what you want. I mean, I think there are a lot of people who are afraid to do that, especially women. And so being able to say, you know what, I think I'm ready for this opportunity, or I think this is how my role should shift, or I think we have a need for this as a business. Again, having a perspective, showing up and being confident and just asking for it. You don't get what you don't ask for. I would say (laughs) that's another kind of uh, lesson I've learned over time. Well, Janelle, you're a great storyteller and you're also a great role model out there, particularly for women that may be, I suppose, reticent to put their hand up and ask for what it is that mm-hmm. they want. And I really think your story is a great example of someone who has managed to to get to the to the C-suite, you know, and, and do it in such a, a wonderful and human fashion. I've really enjoyed our conversation today, Janelle. I really appreciate you sharing your stories and insights with me. Thanks for having me, Brendan. It's been fun talking to you and and I'm uh, honored to have been a guest on your awesome podcast. Oh, you're most welcome. And and maybe in the future, we'll do another episode when the next book comes out. I'm sure you've got something in the (laughs) the works eventually. Yeah, we'll see. Janelle, if people, yeah. Oh, good. Well, keep me informed. If people want to find out more about you, more about the book, more about user testing, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, I mean, looking me up on LinkedIn is a good place to start. Uh, And then I also have my own website. It's just my name, JanelleEstes.com. That has a lot more of my work and information about the book and, and my podcast. So 
Perfect. Thank you, Janelle. I'll make sure that I put a link to LinkedIn and your website and all the all the good things that you've been doing in the show notes to everyone that's tuned in. It's been great having you here as well. As I've just mentioned, check out the show notes because they'll have plenty of good links in here as well as a full chapter breakdown of our conversation. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great stories like this with world-class leaders in UX design and product management, don't forget to leave a review on the podcast. Those are very helpful subscribe and also pass the podcast along to someone else who you feel would get value from these conversations these stories that we tell on this podcast if you want to reach out to me you can find my linkedin profile at the bottom of the show notes as well or you can just find me on linkedin under brendan jarvis or you can head on over to my website which is the space in between.co.nz that's the space in between.co.nz and until next time keep being brave